the space is actually working so far as that there are three entrances. So it's the narrative kind of has to make sense no matter which way someone comes in. And one of the things that I wanted to do was really kind of change it up of how most people come into the space and they see a very kind of dense exhibition of like tons of books and lots of graphics, you know, very complicated, dense builds. And I wanted to open it up, bring the beauty of the white wall, kind of clinical, minimal space, and work with the architecture. And it just kind of seemed appropriate. Um, Martin, who's there, is my designer. He's absolutely amazing. So all the little kind of features, the attention to detail, we had the space planned out through uh, 17 revisions <laughs> uh, to millimeter precision and sort of features like this. You know, this is this is all Martin here. You know, um, down to the fact that, like, say, the light boxes. If you f you can act, they're tactile. You can feel the raised print on the light boxes. The custom font that Ma Martin designed for everything that could exist in 2D. It could it'd be extruded into 3D. Um, all these various formats, so that's, that's the detail that Mark has put into the show. So, how did the show start? Well, three years ago, I met Mahendra um, at a random arts event. We got talking, he told me about labs, he told me about various digital collections, and I started thinking, and then I came back and brought him this idea of wanting to work you know, as an artist in residence with labs. And uh, this is the collection I chose to work with. The One Million Images from Scanbooks Collection. Now, funnily enough, this collection, um, I was talking, taking Rolly through the other day, and uh, he said, well, you know, this collection is really uh, funny because, of course, Adam Farquhar and people in digital scholarship just kind of uploaded it and then told me about it, and it was great. I said, well, well, Rolly, I've kind of named it, and then just kind of told you all about it, because there was no name for this collection. I said, well, I decided to give it a name, and I always name things as they are, so it's one million images from Scam Books, and it exists on Flickr Commons, and the reason I wanted to work with this collection is because it is out there in the public domain, on Flickr Commons, it's free for anyone to access, and it, it, for me, just kind of really sums up what a digital collection should be in this day and age. Um, very public facing. So with that, how the first thing I wanted to do was show the collection itself in both the digital form and the analog form as well. Because now a collection, in my mind, we shouldn't think of a collection like this as, oh, it's a digital or now. It, you know, it's a collection. And it happens to embrace both sides and bring them together. So we start with a million images, and then of course through tagging, through various machine learning um, algorithms, and also in AI networks, and individuals, volunteers, who tag the, tag the maps. Um, they actually tag 50,000 maps through those various processes. From those 50,000, then I started drilling down. So I've done a lot of work with big data, but big data, people think about visualizing everything. I didn't want to do that. I've been there, done that. For this show, I wanted to take a more small data approach where I was going into the collection and using big data methodologies to identify small bits of data, individual items, bringing them out of obscurity and sort of back into the forefront. So the 50,000, I then started developing search strings, thinking about what I would do. I narrowed those down to about 2,000. And at 2,000, I just started looking through manually, because 2,000, that, that's a human, sort of friendly kind of number. I spent a few days looking through those 2,000 maps. And what I decided to do was actually, I was, I was reading uh, Calvino's Invisible Cities at the time. I've been thinking about that and this idea of maps and our connection to maps, how the notion of maps has changed over time. You know, in the 19th century, a map was a map is a map. But in the digital age, a map has taken on new meanings. We, we think about psychological maps. We think about sort of like mapping out processes. You know, mapping is very, it, it's, its definition has really changed because of technology, I think. So I thought, okay, 
let's work with maps and let's also work with cities and urban maps. So I started exploring the collection that way and I narrowed the, two, the 2,000 down to a short list of about 100. And that, and then I took the best cities, you know, the best maps from each city, and here's my little short list here. You know, in digital form where you see the maps, but also what I began to realize, and again, what makes a digital collection special, is that every asset also tracks interactions. You have the tags, you have the favorites, the view counts, and I started thinking, okay, well, in terms of creating work, maybe I wouldn't just use the digital resources and sort of use those to create works, but I could actually, it was this bit, the metadata, that sort of liveness of the collection that I could use. And then in terms of what maps I would select, this is my uh, Dr. Phil Hatfield case here. <laughs> I told him today, so, so Phil is the head of the Eccle Center here at the British Library. But before he was the director of Eccles, he was the digital maps curator. And early on in the project, I was talking with him about sort of, well, what are these maps that I'm looking at? What is their provenance? Where do they come from? What is their context, their history? And he opened me to the idea of that a lot of these were coming from guidebooks. And, uh, and, and most of them were based on Western cities because in the, that 19th century period, it was sort of the rise of a new affluent middle class that was interested and could afford to travel, you know, traverse the Atlantic and visit cities in that sort of, in, in the Western world. So I said, okay, that, you know, it's guidebooks. And again, sort of the, the relationship between then and now, Google Maps, TripAdvisor now, back then it's the Cook's Handbook. So this is the sort of little display I have kind of in his honor, which shows the guidebooks as they are, you know, as, you know, you would take these, they were well-worn, used, you would go out, you would travel the world with them. And then, sort of kind of to jump in another direction, so now it was time to pick the maps. Now it was time to think about how I would take this and create artworks out of them. Well, an artistic process is always like a dialogue between you know, time, money, resources, space, what you have to draw upon. And I wanted to work with the architecture of the building um, and the space that I had. So I thought, okay, we have enough room here for four major installations. You know, two more. To, if, if there's more, it's too crowded, too let, you know, too few, and it's barren. So no, four major installations. And I thought, for the public, one map, one installation it makes a nice sort of relationship. And then in terms of picking those cities, it's like, okay. At first, I was thinking about cities around the world, but the collection really is only Western cities. So thinking about the West, thinking about that transatlantic divide, and if I did two and two, what should the cities be? Well, in Europe, obviously London, obviously Paris, and then on the other side, obviously New York, and obviously Chicago. So from that, <laughs> I then did a further selection. And I found my maps. And here they are. So here is Chicago, here is London, here is Paris, and here is New York. And I picked these I picked these maps, but then it was also important for me to show them in the context of the books, you know, and to and to celebrate them as objects that I found through the digital collection. So bring them back. Um, the placards, the, the, uh, the notes to give the context, is those, those are all by Phil as well, which was a nice little touch. So the person that turned me on to the ideas here um, about sort of the context of these, these books is the one who's actually provided the, the captions for visitors coming in. Now, and here, this, this little funny story here. So um, all the books, of course, I physically handled during the process of my research, but as we all know, some of the books are just too fragile to be displayed. It's, it, this is basically a fold-out separate map from this particular volume here, but the volume itself is really deteriorating and couldn't be displayed, so the conservation said, we can't show this. I said, okay, I understand. 
but then we're going to actually show it in its, its safe box, you know, its, its archive box. And uh, the exhibitions officer, Geraldine, I was working with, took her a long time to, to explain to conservation why this was important to me. And it was. And, you know, for a few different reasons. I mean, in terms of the concept, I like to show things as they are. And also in terms of the library, and, you know, it also shows why the digital is important. Because as things, a physical object, it degrades. How do you provide access? You provide access through a, through a digital collection. So, there became my maps. And for me, these are actually part of the artworks themselves. So now these objects exist. Half is an artwork, and half is part of a collection. And I wanted to find that kind of bridge between the two. And talking about bridges, um, to do what I wanted to do, that was to take the maps and rework them into these artistic creations and installations. I wanted to track the metadata. I wanted to track people's interactions with the collection itself. So to do that, I needed to bring in someone to the team that could do the heavy if lifting, sort of the back end. And, and David Steele, who's there talking with my designer, Martin, I've known David for 20 years. Um, he developed North America's first SRS2 application backbone, dealing with billions of transactions a day. So there's every other program I really know, and then there's David Steele. <laughs> and, and, and David, I, I said, I, I came with him to him with the idea, and I said, David, I, I, can you work with me to develop this server application that acts as a bridge between the collection and the artworks. That will basically go, it will track what is happening to the collection every day, save that information, and then use that plus my own artistic kind of designs and instructions to generate for every map that we choose a source data, sort of image data that gets generated every day. And David luckily said yes. I'll say intermediate data. Intermediate data, yeah, it's a good word in this case. Intermediate data. So, and also in the whole sort of notion of showing things in their analog and digital form, um, I wanted to present David's server code as an object because this is very important. You know, this is the bridge between the collection and the artwork. So, going very old school, I took his six pages, it ends up being six A4 pages of code. This is the actual program. It's open source. He's released it on GitHub. Um, we typeset it. We printed it out on beautiful archive paper. I made him sign it and edition it. And you have the analog form and you have the digital form, which is also kind of funny because it's a, such a small program and it's sitting on a 16 gig stainless steel flash drive. It's really only a few kilobytes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and you were telling me that, that back in the day, you used to do, you know, programmers, they would print out their code, you do code reviews. Code reviews, or just to look through it, debug, yeah. I mean, even debugging. Yeah, it was yeah. really common, but not for the last 20 years or so. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and never on sort of like, no, fine no, art, no. cotton, archive, paper. Certainly just office paper, yeah. of course. Yeah. yeah. So. And, and, and creating it as also as a manuscript for the library. Yeah, that's what and according to a few people here, um, like Adam and Jamie, we think this is the first time that code has actually been showcased as an object in the British you. Library, um, which is quite special. So now, on to the four artworks. Fantastic. So what I wanted to do, so David's server application was going to generate a set of intermediate image data for each day, for each map that I would that I would basically designate. Um, and then I would take that data and I would do further like multiple layers of processing and transformations and then bring it into some kind of aesthetic form that I wanted to pay homage to the city itself. So this is Paris. This one's Paris. This is Paris here. And for me, Paris, you know, it has that unique star-shaped pattern. It is, a, it is a city of precious material, of beauty, of wonder. So here, this is images 
from data points from 2018. Um, I decided I wanted to go very old school. This is 24 karat gold leaf um, on 100% cotton board. So I took the cotton board, I hand dyed it, I sealed it, I gilded it, and then I took David's, the, the server, um, output for these days and then I did a series of reprocessing I used old school like digital print techniques back in the day of like where you would produce you know black transparency film and use that to make your plate and then take that to your life press so I used techniques like that to come up with these images they're printed at 1200 dpi on the latest generation of direct media system it's, it's actually a million pound system <laughs> And, and I know there's a company in the Midlands that I've known the director for years, he loves my work, and his eldest son basically booked out the machine for a day and just sat around with me. They're so beautiful, I hope they'll be displayed in the library. Sorry? I said they're so beautiful. They're real, real to like places to be. Ah. Yes. Well, that's a conversation. <laughs> Conversations with the other. I just think they are very beautiful. So it is the finest, so everything is by my hand. So I then took those, printed them, cut them out, and then so it is a print, but then I wanted to make it kind of an object, so it's then other archive materials floated out, and then it's box framed. Um, and so it's this print object, something very precious, very one-off. Um, I have signed them on the back, but I don't like my signature to pollute the beauty of the aesthetic, so <laughs> it's on the back. Um, but these are one-off, unique objects, which also hark to Phil opened me up to the notion, to to the um, notion that the maps in the books were actually based off of, you know, sketches of really big maps that were the one-off maps and the precious things that people would pay to get access to. So it's also kind of an homage to that. And then these are data points from 2018. So it shows the progression over time. So this is the 1st of January, the 2nd of April, the 2nd of July, and the 1st of October. So you have 90 day intervals. So you see how, because the server application takes my instructions. So if you think of the American conceptual artist Sola Wet, it was all about sort of defining instructions that then a gallery or a museum or someone else would then like paint and through instructions on the wall and they would paint the color fields. I work in that tradition, but now it's done through, say, a server application that data is produced, where he has my instructions, but on any given day, we have different variables because time moves forward, so we always get a little bit of change through variable of time. But we also have the interactions of the collection, of people on the collection, which David, because he doesn't like people to game the system, he takes those, those sort of um, the tags and the view counts, and he, he changes them into a cryptographic <laughs> hash, and that hash is then used as a variable to also, um, the technical term according to David is perturb. He, the, the image is then perturbed by plus or minus 10%, so you just can't, you don't know what's going to happen. So this is the change in the transformations over time, 90 day interval snapshots. I love, I love the color. So this is Paris. The next 2D image, so I wanted two pieces that were more digital in their output and two which were more analog. This is the first of the digital ones. This is London. So for London, I wanted to reference the organic nature of the city. I wanted this grayscale, detailed, black and white aesthetic. And I also wanted to use the landscape because British, English, landscape. It just makes sense. So this is Samsung's latest generation of 4K panels, HDR panels. So that's 4K times three, so 12K resolution in sync, running at 30 frames per second, being driven by one computer that composes both the images and the soundscape you hear in real time. So everything is real time for the moment. And this is based off the whole years of data of 2018. So it's all of the data from 2018 constantly being remixed. And for a little finishing touch, I didn't want it just ever to be seen as like, this is just screens on a wall. So the frames, again, I tapped into my science background. They are gilded with sterling silver. 
and then I've chemically distressed them and sealed them to complete, you know, everything by my hand. So it, it, it's funny because it, it took me about a week to do the frames because <laughs> it's such a complicated and fragile process. And during the install, because the screens are so expensive, I was like, when we're so I was like, if we break a screen, we're okay. If my cost is two thousand pounds, but we're okay. I said we can't break the frames because I can't redo them. So this is London. Over to this piece. This is Chicago. <clears throat> so when thinking about Chicago, um, I, I always think about Frank Lloyd Wright. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of his in terms of sort of, and it seems so appropriate for this show, talking about cities and building and, and referencing architecture. And one of the things that I love about Wright is that, you know, he takes modernism in terms of the, the architecture, and he was just such a pioneer for taking, for his time, the leading industrial process and blending that, hybridizing it with like traditional materials and craft technique. So for that, for this piece, the data point is actually his birthday from 2018. And I took the server output for that day, and then I took and I transformed it into a vector path. And the vector path I then transformed into a tool path, which I then worked at a fab lab, it's a local fab lab in Coventry, um, that I used their big laser cutting machine. And I manipulated the hardware to do not an etch, not a cut, something in between. So it's like this deep route. I was able to get the hardware to do this deep route. And, and on that tool path, and then route out that design um, onto wood, and the wood is hand finished, hand finished by myself, Sapele hardwood, so Sapele is the mahogany family. Um, so I, I made the design, I went to Birmingham's like biggest lumber merchant, bought out all their big Sapele boards, got this machine, hand finished it down into the, the various blanks that I needed, took it to the fab lab, did the, the laser routing out, and then and then filled the routed channels with a um, with a UV reactive pigment, sanded it down several times, and then hand finished it with Danish oil, which is a traditional process of woodworking. So I wanted to create something that was an homage to to write um, that was unapologetically digital. You get the feeling of a circuit board, you know, the technological feel with the glow, but at the same time, it's it's hardwood. You know, there's imperfections, it's my hand finishing, it's, there's a lot of, you know, it's, well, it's all of me, you know, whether it's a, it's a craftsmanship sort of woodworking process or the traditional process, it's all by hand. I used to work at King's College in Digital Humanities all right. as an artist and researcher in residence, and uh, Harold Short, I don't, I don't know if you know him, he was my first head of department, he used to always talk about the craft of computing. And it's something that really has always stayed with me. And so this, for me, this kind of sums up, you know, craft and computing and the craft of technology and the craft of tradition, you know, of, of manual process. So that is, that is Chicago. And then... I've always tried to do that. Um, and this here is the final installation, which is all digital. This is New York. Now, again, paying homage to New York. New York, everyone sees as the city that is always changing, never sleeps, completely reinvents itself, reconstructs itself. And I said, well, why don't we actually bring that into some kind of reality? So, this piece I've done in collaboration with another longtime collaborator, Drew Baker, who's based in Australia. But if, if David is the god of all things server, Drew is the god of all things 3D. He is the top 1% of 1%. He was he's been working in 3D since online printing since 3D since the first things like 25 years ago. He's, he's quite amazing. So my idea with Drew was that David's server application generates a 2D map plan. A small image that is made up again like the other works for that day. 
Drew has done this in UDP 3D, which is a games engine. So his engine connects, his program connects across the internet, pulls in that map image, and then takes that 2D map plan and extrudes it into three dimensions, into the city. So, like I did the texturing and the modernist design, Drew did other kind of architectural features, kind of like, I guess the analogy is we created the Lego building blocks that then the map plan that were used as the city is extruded. And then you have the styling view in the top 20%. And here on the Oculus, you have the street view where you can you put, your, you put your glasses in first. So, through, and slide that. Where you're in the lower, sort of floating above the street view of the city. And then again, another soundscape, an algorithmic soundscape to kind of complete the experience. Because in traditions of VR, it's not just about visual senses, but it's about sound as well. It's about a communal space, which is why. Yes, yes. So that so basically, it's an automated, a random viewpoint as you're going through the city, but then you decide where to. And then in terms of, as a last little kind of piece break, I decided for this piece, if we go to the, the, the map where it's based on, most people think of New York, of course, as this, this big giant grid structure, which it is now. But I found, it's a 19th century book, but it actually, the map is of New York when it's just emerging from 1760, 1766. And that sort of age where you see it just kind of starting to emerge, and I've spent so much time in New York, and some of the streets are still there today, but it's sort of like in its earliest form, and then that, it kind of takes it to this imaginary, sort of like, so far future thinking form. Um, so that was another little thing that I was thinking about there. I wanted the exhibition to be a, um, a gateway to the collection itself. So, we have a QR code here, anyone on their phone, most people do have QR our code readers, and we do this, and then we interface straight to the source map. But basically, it gives you straight to the Flickr collection. There we go. And, and not only does it allow you to have access into the collection this way, so the idea of the artwork kind of as an interface to the collection, but because this is changing every day, because every day is a new city, because that our interaction we just did now informs how tomorrow's city will be generated. So it's that, so people would say, is it an interactive exhibition? It's like, well, yes, it is. Just not how you would traditionally think of point and click. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and the last thing that I really wanted to highlight with this show was, um, because I've spent a lot of time in, in research, I, I have been part of like a visualization lab that was in the University of Warwick and then went to King's College for the better part of 10 years and I still have a lot of colleagues in HE and um, a lot of the work that sort of researchers and librarians do um, just gets kind of unnoticed or members of the public would be like, oh, well, so what? Even if they knew about it, they'd be like, well, so what? why is this important? So one of the things that I wanted to do with the show was to, to wow people with these creations, but also show the importance of all the work that has gone, you know, from the first digitization projects, I think the first important one here was like Beowulf, um, which actually one of my heads of department is involved in. Um, you know, it's just millions of hours. All this resource has been put into developing these digital infrastructures, which most people would say, oh, well, so what? And for me, my answer is, do you like this show? And, and I've seen members of the public like peeking in, fascinated by it. if you like this show you have to pay credibility and you have to pay homage to that 20 years of work because without that this does not exist it's it's really as simple as that so yes it's not just me it's my collaborators that I've worked with but it's also all the work of the library you know over those two decades now you're just simply going to say that when you stand up. <laughs> that is just all you, you, you can just talk as you've talked to me. You don't need a script like I do. <laughs>